that, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Diane Harris Klein. Uh, she's an associate professor of classics and history at George Washington University, where she teaches courses on ancient history, archaeology, mythology, literature, and culture. In her research, she's a pioneer in the digital humanities, uh, applying social network analysis to the ancient world. Um, she's a Fulbright scholar with degrees from Stanford and Princeton. She's traveled extensively in the Mediterranean, Aegean, Near East, and Black Sea regions, uh, including as an expert study leader for Smithsonian Journeys and National Geographic Expeditions. She's the author of The Treasures of the Parthenon and Erepian, and and as well as The Greeks in Illustrated History. Uh, she can let me know if I need to be corrected on uh, that uh, first book title pronunciation. And uh, anyway, with that, uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring her up on screen. And I will be in the chat field helping anybody who's having technical difficulties. And I'll see all of you after the Q&A. So bear with me just a moment. OK, Diane, you're unmuted and ready to go. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, Peter Schmidt, of course, is the uh, brains behind this brilliant idea of profs and pints. And while it has been fantastic to have people from all over the country come to our talks based in Washington, D.C., we also are looking forward to actually seeing you all live in the future. Um, so raise a glass and we'll get started on this topic that's been near and dear to my heart uh, for coming up on 10 years of research on the social networks of the ancient Greeks. And this is a very hot new field for the humanities and particularly for ancient Greece and classics, the field of study for Greek and Latin and Greek and Roman culture and civilizations. Uh, so I begin with this uh, very general notion that comes to us from sociology, which is that the evolution of our lives is a result of a combination of our own preferences, our own choices that we make, and the force of our surrounding social network structures. Now, you may know the Greeks as an incredibly uh, vibrant and creative peoples who were enormously inventive and innovative beyond our expectations of ancient people from 2,500 years ago. And it occurred to me that we needed to understand what made them so creative and innovative. We needed that 10 years ago and we need it today because they have the secret sauce. Somehow they made these gains, these great strides in so many fields over a period of decades, maybe a century or two in some fields that have, have lasted, have enormous impact. So in the past, in classics, the study of the Greek and Roman civilizations, um, we've looked pretty much at individual geniuses, uh, like Socrates, uh, saying that it was his genius that developed this new form of philosophy, Socratic philosophy, uh, versus the pre-Socratics. Uh, but these days, I'm part of a group of people who are looking more at that second part, the social structure. And there are certain social structures in our social networks that are conducive to rapid spread of ideas that are uh, enabling innovations to spread. And there are other social structures that have a lot of gatekeepers that keep the cliques, the uh, small clusters or uh, groups separate and do not allow information to flow. We know this, right? So I feel uh, it was worth it to take a look at the Greeks and see how open, how innovative their structure was and what we can learn from that and how we can uh, test it out in our own um, society. 
So let's just take a look. I'll remind you just tip of the iceberg. If you want to think for a moment, what is it? What is your snap thought of what made the Greeks famous? Like, why do we study people from 2,500 years ago? And why is it even possible to know any individual person's name, like Pericles there on the lower left or uh, Aristotle there on the right? How is that possible? Let me put it another way. Do you personally think that your name will be remembered 2,500 years from now? So... What are they famous for? Um, of course, I'll show you some architecture in a few slides, uh, the development of sort of the human form uh, in sculpture that you can picture in your mind, I'm sure. The creation of theater, of drama, of the actual building for a theater and of Greek tragedies, Greek comedies that are the basis for our you know, television shows and movies. Uh, they made great strides in math, of course, and astronomy, and these are two fields of study that they learned from earlier civilizations in the Near East, Babylon in particular. But what the Greeks were able to do was to synthesize earlier knowledge and then popularize it, that is, somehow get the word out about their discoveries. So Pythagoras, for example, let's just take him for a minute. Uh, Pythagoras traveled to the Near East. He went and looked at these kind of schools of thought. And he was from Italy. I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, he was from Italy. He went off to Babylon and other places. And he came back and he developed first some poetry and song that kind of circulated his ideas. It's easier to memorize songs or poems than it is for prose. And then he started a kind of uh, cult, a philosophical school, you could call it, where numbers, um, numbers like we know the Pythagorean theorem, but that numbers corresponded to sort of the movement of the planets and stars. He had this really elaborate theory about harmonics. If you play instruments that have harmonics, you'll know there are these sequences, you know, of the octave and above that, and that kind of can go ad infinitum. So he got the word out somehow, but this, the culture was such that people were receptive to listening, and that too is part of the trick of the diffusion of innovation. So I want just to take a, a peek at uh, democracy for a moment, and also to share with you uh, how involved people just were in their daily lives with each other and how they mixed and matched. That is, they uh, were parts of one group and then they also were parts of another group and through those they met different people and they expanded their own social networks and they were able to introduce others and on. So we'll take a look at this tonight, but I just wanted to introduce you to just a few of these ideas. So when I talk about social networks, I want you to picture these kinds of network diagrams with which you are familiar. Uh, you've opened the back of your flight magazine, you've seen these, uh, and you intuitively kind of understand how to read it. That is where it's denser and thicker, that's a hub, and where the lines are kind of lighter, it might mean that the terminus of that line doesn't have a lot of airplanes coming in very often. So the same goes for our social network. And generally speaking, in our, in our own networks, we're kind of the star of it, we're going to have the highest number of associations with others, or I'll call them ties, with other people nodes, other people, um, and there will be a few other people we know who are kind of popular like that, but most people will be very, very low. It's a very long tail. It's called the power law curve, if you're familiar with that. We're also going to talk about some statistics, basically, that the science of social network analysis allows us to see, and these include those 
bridges or brokers that we just mentioned, where they're sort of gatekeeper people who either facilitate or prevent you from taking the quickest path to where you need to be or to get information across that you're going to have to sidestep that person and go hop, hop, hop until you can find them unless they open that darn door. So you can see that those are basically these hubs, these hubs that if you took one out, it would make it much more difficult to get across the network. You'd have to do some of that hopping I just talked about. So we'll talk about some of those network structures as well, but we're applying them to the ancient Greeks, right? Okay, so let me introduce then a few of my experiments. I'll be showing and sharing these throughout the evening. But the very first thing that I um, uh, published was the social network of Alexander the Great. It was an experiment and no one had tried it before for my field. And I developed the technique of assembling basically a data set that would work. And uh, we see Alexander's portrait in the marble sculpture at the top, right? And below in the spirals, I um, was able to sort out the many people, about 400 nodes, 400 people in the network into their ethnic groups. You might or might not know that Alexander is famous because he conquered so many places and he went primarily east so he started in macedon and um, northern greece he worked his way over to asia minor which we would call the west coast of turkey he then proceeded south through syria uh, then um, lebanon and israel and gaza and down to egypt came back up through syria uh, going east into uh, Iraq, and then he conquered Iran, the Persian Empire. He went north into the Hindu Kush to Uzbekistan and Tajikistan and then Pakistan, and he ended up in India at the Indus River and then came back down and died in Babylon at the age of 32. Uh, so in all of those conquests, he came across about at least 25 different ethnic groups that are mentioned in the primary sources. We have ancient writers who recorded these adventures. So the largest spiral in the left are all Macedonians. They're uh, Macedonians who were along on campaign, who were his companions. And then the next largest group are Persians and Greeks and Indians and Egyptians and Babylonians and other different groups, uh, about 23 or so in all. Now, the red lines, um, as you'll get to know in the sequence that I'll show you tonight, um, all kind of emanate from one node, which is Alexander the Great, because he is the ego of the social network that we're studying. Um, if you were to do your own social network um, chart, sociogram we call it, you would be that red dot that kind of goes out to the others. What I'm interested though in my studies are the gray lines which are how the other people, not Alexander, are interacting with each other, are tied to each other, because that's the, the, the weaving, the web of the social fabric that we can sort of observe, whether it's um, permeable and, or dense or fragmented, uh, whether it's conducive for the diffusion of innovation, in other words. So above, on the left, we are looking at the social network of Socrates. And again, I've labeled in red that Socrates. And I'll come back to this again in a more extensive version of uh, the social network of Socrates. But I really want you just to stare at the gray lines going basically from the 
big blue wheel who are not intellectuals, not scholars of any kind, not tutors or, or teachers or philosophers. They didn't study with so Socrates. They aren't Socratics. They're the rest of society and how they're related to all of those intellectuals. That interests me. So we'll explore that a little bit later. Okay. But first I have to ask a basic question, like really basic question. Where was ancient Greece? All right, just where are we talking about? Who are these people I am calling Greeks? And you might think, well, it's got to be there. And you're kind of right that out of the um, uh, Bronze Age into the Iron Age and the Dark Ages, when there's sort of a transition of culture, about a 400-year dormancy, that's the homeland. And we call it Greece, and the modern state calls it Greece, except for parts of Turkey. Um, but uh, in ancient Greece, there was no place called ancient Greece. In other words, there was no country. There were Greek-speaking people who led a Greek style of life. That's what they were. They called themselves Hellenes. The Hellenes, Hellas, was their word for Greece, kind of. Okay. But even that was loose. It didn't mean that there was, you know, a king or, you know, monarchy of any sort. There's no leadership at all. There are alliances that shift and change. And each Greek city, and there maybe were a thousand of them or so, each Greek city could decide its own constitution, whether it wants to have a monarch, whether it wants to be an oligarchy led by aristocrats or led by the oldest in the town. Um, and finally, uh, after uh, centuries, they developed democracy too. And I'll talk about that a little bit later, but there were these three forms and you can even mix and match uh, like Sparta did. They had all three of them as elements in their constitution. What I wanna point out then is that everything that you see in red are, are cities, coastlines occupied by Greeks in the classical period. So they had interactions with colleagues, with people they traded with, with visitors who came as far away as Spain and um, France, which you can see with some red, a little bit of Corsica and Sardinia, um, the boot of Italy, that is the heel and the toe, and Sicily, about half of it, a little more than half. Going across the Adriatic, Albania, which has phenomenal archaeology to visit. It's, it's astonishing. Uh, Greece, of course, and northern Greece and Thrace. And then the west coast of Turkey, which is labeled here Asia Minor, and the southern coast as well, that peninsula. But then if you go up through, uh, they called it the Hellespont, we call it the Dardanelles, and then the Sea of Marmara, you get to the Black Sea. And do you notice how red that is? Like, there are Greeks around the whole of the Black Sea. So there are Greek cities with Greek temples, with polytheism as their religion, with these constitutions, with their form of education, with their rituals at night of symposia in Romania, Bulgaria, the Crimean Peninsula, the Ukraine, Georgia, all the way around then to that Pontic region, the north part of Turkey. It is amazing. And then going down past Crete south, of course, east to Cyprus, but south to um, Egypt, but mainly Libya, where again, there's an amazing city called Cyrene. It's under the protection of the uh, United Nations. Uh, and it uh, has, you know, a, an enormous Greek city there in Cyrene. Well, these places were already occupied <laughs> to some extent. So we call it Greek colonization, but 
You know, it's not really imperialism because there's no dominant um, dictator, monarch, ruling body of any kind. These are individual decisions of, let's say, small towns or medium-sized towns. Uh, We call them city-states because they have an urban core and a kind of territory, which is where their farming gets done. So they just decided, and there are lots of reasons put forth, but they just decided, uh, let's go out and found a new place where second and third sons, who would be prohibited from inheriting land back home, could get a portion of land, could give it a real, get a real start. And they developed these fantastic ports and cities that became greater than the mothership, which is called the metropolis. The word polis is for city, so metro, mother, mother polis. So the metropolis gives out, sort of sends out some, some boys, really, on a boat with an elected leader. And they might have consulted the Delphic Oracle first to find out where to go. And the Delphic Oracle was sort of a central intelligence agency because people came from all over the Greek world and they would ask questions, you know, why do we have a drought and what should we do about it? And the Delphic Oracle having just heard that there's this great place in Libya called Cyrene, you know, that needs occupation would send them all there. So this is a phenomenon that goes on for roughly 150 to 200 years, uh, slightly longer in some cases, kind of unregulated. And this is another beauty of the system of the Greeks that I think leads to innovation, which is the sort of self-organizing principle underneath complex adaptive systems. So I would like to show you briefly um, all of these Greek temples that bear very strong resemblances to each other. They're part of Greek culture. They weren't for interior worship. That is, you didn't go inside and sit in a pew or anything. Um, You had an altar outside for animal sacrifice. And that ritual would be part of a procession uh, with chanting and uh, and then a, the animal would be uh, slaughtered and the fat and bones would go on the altar and be, you know, lit on fire. And that would send a smoke signal up above the tree lines that people around would know to come. And it smelled very pungent as well, of course. And then the meat would be chopped up into very small sort of souvlaki style cubes we assume, and put into a huge stew pot. There are these cauldrons that have been excavated, um, beautiful you know, bronze vessels that were a communal meal, and it was the only time that ancient Greeks really ate meat. Uh, so they liked coming to you know, the temple for that reason. Uh, so there's this Greek culture that spread all over the region. And so I want to first talk about trade networks as a way that you know, you or I living 2,500 years ago would grow our social networks. Let's um, think to being a child, being a baby, really. Okay, you come home. um, They didn't have hospitals. Okay, they had home births. We come home and we have our parents and maybe grandparents and maybe siblings. And that's our social network. And I could chart that on a little whiteboard in a second flat, right? But then, as time goes on, you bring the baby with you to other larger gatherings, to social gatherings. And the child now, you know, growing up, meets other children. Those are all one degree of separation. One degree, one hop. But now the child, you spend the night at a friend's house, And now you are one degree, not two, from her mother, her father, her siblings, expanding that social network. Now, just to get out of ancient Greece for a moment and go over to our own elementary schools, 
think about how when you were uh, in first grade, you would meet those children, and some of them you continued to go up with because they stayed in town, you stayed in town. Sometimes there was more than one classroom, and so you might mix and match and be with a blend of students from another class and your own from last year. And as you go up, you're going to know more and more people, and your parents are going to take you out to bigger and bigger places where they know a lot more people. So I want you to continue thinking that now all the way up to graduating from high school to the end of your under, you know, your elementary uh, career. How many people do you know? How many people have you met? First degree. How many people do you think you've met? What about second degree? How big does it get at second degree? If you could really remember every single person you met, you had a tie to, you might have sat on a park bench next to, you might have been at a picnic with. One degree of separation, direct. Yeah, go ahead and put it in the chat. How many people do you think you met with one degree? And now, second degree, you're adding everyone they know to your own. But there'll be a lot of overlap because you went to school together. And that's where you get really interesting because you get these nodes in common, right? Three degree, can you picture that at the end of high school? Everyone, let's say, who was in the gymnasium watching you play basketball and who they know. Do you see now going out one, two, three, four, five, six hops, how you could know Kevin Bacon, <laughs> right? It's possible. But that's the thing. We cannot keep it in our heads. We cannot keep in our brain who knows who. And what I discovered when working on Socrates, for example, is that when you read through all of Plato, Plato's dialogues and the letters at the end, you can't remember who was in the room with who. You can't remember who was walking down the street and met each other. You just can't. Even scholars who studied Plato all their lives or experts on Socrates in philosophy could not possibly write down the names of everyone Socrates knew. And that's when I thought I might have a project. Okay? So trade networks. Let's talk about general terms before we get into all these diagrams. General terms. We've got a group of sailors. Well, first let me just say that land travel was horrible. Land travel. Let's say you wanted to go to the Olympic Games and you lived in Arcadia. It doesn't make sense to go hopping from port to port on the outside because you're deep in the Peloponnese in the inside, in the mountains. So you will take that mountain route, which most people don't want to take. And in fact, before the Olympic Games were held in Athens in 2004, people dreaded going through that mountain pass on modern roads, it was awful. I always felt like throwing up. <laughs> so, so you know, you go through and you have to sleep there and you have to find, en route, and you have to find water. So you're in a cart and you generally would carry with the people you're traveling with, a small family, whatever, like your, you know, sedan, your hatchback, you'd carry all the food you need for a month and water if you can, but usually you have to just try to find it. There were robbers because everything you had was on that wagon. So there were bandits to watch out for. There were wild animals. Basically, if you could avoid land travel, you would. And that's how all of these red lines you're seeing kind of developed. They are both for merchant ships, occasionally warships, but we're on the merchant side and travel. But the thing is, 
they did not have ferries. They did not have boats that were for passengers. So basically you were at the mercy of a merchant ship and the captain. So they would come into a port and you would say, where are you going next? And they're saying, I'm going over to Sicily. I'm like, can I hitch a ride? And you say, well, for two drachmas, yeah, I'll give you a ride. And they would join basically the uh, adventure. So we've got um, professionals, that is mariners, seafarers. We have the merchants who are trying to get their products to different um, ports. Manufacturers who are counting on these ships uh, because the sale of these things and emptying the ship means that the merchant will want a refill. And you've got customers waiting in ports. All of these are social activities and they are interdependencies. It's a kind of interlock. All of these things need to happen in order for the system to survive. So we're on one of these ships the little circles there and the slash lines are oarsmen. Uh, and we see lovely little dolphins flying off the Aegean Sea going into the Mediterranean. And it was up to the merchant to uh, talk with a captain and decide where to go. No one told them where to go. It was totally his choice. What he would find is if he, hmm, let's say, went to Sicily every third Thursday, he could count on some passengers who would pay him two drachmas each to go on to Corsica, right? So it became regular, but no one was telling him how to do that. And there was no timetable for these kinds of adventures. So picture now all of those little heads with their oars. Um, each of them has a social network just like you. They grew up in a village. They uh, had villagers who all knew them and watched them as they were growing up. Maybe their parent, their father, had also been a mariner and was raising the son to kind of come up and do the same thing. So they have similar social networks, but not necessarily identical, because some of these they picked up in different ports. And after many years, it might be a sort of multi-city uh, crew. So uh, what I want you to think about as we go through this is how is this social network changing on board? You've got, let's just say, 20 men on this ship, 20 men. And they each probably minimally have about 100 people that they know. And there will be overlap between them because they go out for drinks with the same people in the same ports time after time and they all know each other. But we're developing individual and unique relationships too whenever they go off um, onto the shore, go off the boat onto the shore. You have older men who might drag younger men in harbor to see their best friend, uh, at least the best friend for this port, uh, or show him around uh, and introduce him around to the merchants there. Because not only was the ship, which is laden with goods, olive oil, wines, tapestries, bottles of various sorts, um, weren't, they were uh, offloading and hopefully you know, selling these goods, but then they were bringing on to the local items that they uh, were interested in uh, selling in other ports. So we have young men, we have old men, they're getting off the boat. The materials are also coming off the boat. The materials in an archaeological setting we call um, a, an assemblage. The assemblage inside the ship is static until the second that they uh, disembark because the guys drag their knapsacks and they might, you know, trade off a few things and bring back a few things. And so the assemblage on board on departure is different. Heraclitus, famous philosopher, pre-Socratic, um, you know, said you can never step in the same river twice. 
that everything is always in flux. Always in flux. And so are their social relationships. Leaving the ship and getting back on the ship, they've met new people, and they themselves might be changed. They've heard new stories. We know from later times, uh, East India Shipping Company studies, um, that because uh, different mariners from different ships would end up in the same bars, they would tell each other, this is a hot new market. You should try this area. And it would change the itinerary. They'd go off and go try that. So things were changing all the time. And they come back with new stories, new ideas, new stuff in their backpack, cleaner, better well-rested to get back on. The people on shore are changed too with their interactions with these people, with bringing them into their own homes perhaps for just a few drachmas uh, to spend the night, feeding them, giving them a bath or place to change uh, and trading with them and sharing information and stories and news. They all come back changed. And these are very important hubs for the diffusion of innovation, meaning new ideas being developed in these different places are shared in these ports. So there are about a thousand Greek city-states by, you know, when it's fully developed, 5th, 4th centuries BC. And uh, in all of those cities, we're finding this phenomenon. So what I developed two years ago is this kind of a graph. I'm calling it a field map. And what I'm looking at is a couple of things. First, the people, and I had grouped them. Uh, when, they, when they hit the, you know, the harbor, they've got repairs that need to be done. And so they're going to go to the dock workers who are gonna need tools and then tool makers. They need more wood, which means that the loggers and the ax men need to get into gear. Then they're going to need carts who are gonna bring that wood into the ship shed to do the work, or they're going to need a sail and there's you know weavers that are needed. In other words, there's a lot of codependency of interlock of all of these kinds of activities that people are doing and the materials that they require. And to be attractive to merchant ships, these harbors are gonna need to make it clear that they can do these repairs quickly, efficiently, and cheaply. So they're going to be responding and learning about when these ships tend to come in, what kinds of injuries they have, and anticipate them. And that is the definition of a complex adaptive system. It's a complex system, but adaptive, meaning it can learn. And there's no one in charge, remember? The mariner comes in, it's his own damn choice. You've got the people making the carts, they could be picking grapes. They chose to make carts, nobody's forcing them to. And it's all working in a very uh, self-organizing system, a self-organizing way. So once I began to map those things in, you know, very deep terms. So for example, with olive oil, if we were to click on that, it would go out to a very deep and big network diagram of all the things and all the people and all the places that are involved in manufacturing that oil, going out to the trees and the plantings and the shaking and getting the olives and the press and who's making the press and all the other farmers who are using the press same time in getting the ceramicists involved, etc. Each of these you could probe and it would be like a three-dimensional chess set. You know, you could go way down underneath them. But at the top, what I hadn't seen before in any charts were the capital letter fields. Technology, for example, it's coming around, I think. 
uh, where you've got um, technology like navigation uh, and the way you know ships are built, uh, but also the support for the technology that's required and so forth. Okay, so this is a map taken from all Greek and Latin literature of antiquity, and it shows every port mentioned by at least one ancient author. Now, the Greek merchant ships, and basically all ships, had a season, and they had to stop basically in late October, and they could pick up sort of in March. So March to October, in every one of these places where you see a red dot, you have to picture the activity I just described, which was for one ship. <laughs> and now picture 10 ships, 15 ships coming into some of these harbors. The degree of information, of social network development, and of being sort of in dynamic flux and change and feeling that one is part of something greater than the sum of its parts, another definition of a complex adaptive system, this is what we're talking about for ancient Greece. So now let's go <laughs> to the mundane, shall we? Um, these are the uh, code shares, that is the, you can you know buy your ticket on Delta, but you're actually flying on Virgin Atlantic or vice versa. We're going to now go in a little bit deeper to the structure of what social networks look like and the kind of statistical information we can get from networks. Um, so first of all, if you just look at this thing, the densest area that you can see is, I think it's Newark, it's not quite New York, it's Newark right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. I hope so. London, obviously, is an important one for Virgin Atlantic as well. And it seems like there may be some other densities here in the middle, but San Diego is a certain one for the, um, the left, for the west, the west coast. But there are also um, some very lonely little nodes like Montego Bay. Uh, or Aberdeen, or Edinburgh, which have one tie, <laughs> and that's to the hub, and none others, no others. And same with from San Diego, um, these places in Hawaii, they're solo. They only have a connection or a tie to San Diego, and that's it. Others might have two, like a kind of elbow, like here from Portland and over. So you can see then, I hope, that there are just a couple of these nodes that are extremely important. The first way they're important is that they have the greatest quantity of ties. It's the easiest thing to figure out when we're looking at networks. Like which one, you count them up, how many places are tied to it? Oh, 14. Got it. Really easy to do even visually in your head. Okay. Um, another tie which is of interest is called the eigenvector centrality measure. I'll show that in writing to you soon. Um, and that is where nodes um, with high scores, where the one you're looking at has connections to only or basically nodes with high scores. So the ones that were at the top, we said San Diego, we said Newark, we said London, those are the ones with high scores so far. So if you can find another one like Boston, for example, that seems to be connected to London and to Newark, and I can't quite tell, but possibly San Diego, that would score huge. It only has three ties, but it would be at the very top of the eigenvector centrality hierarchy. Third, there will be betweenness centrality. And that means that uh, these are the bridges, the gatekeepers, 
They are the way that parts of the network can get information or even meet people on the other side of the network. So San Diego, again, serves for sure as very high in betweenness centrality. And the reason is that if you eliminated that node, if you took out San Diego, all of the places on the West Coast and Hawaii would be cut off from the network. You see that? There are a couple other ones that might be interesting, but they have redundant ways to get around to the important uh, nodes. But San Diego holds a lot of power there. That's the thinking, that's all I'm saying, is this is the thinking of looking at the network as a whole. So there are two things we're interested in in social network analysis. We're interested in the whole, and we're interested in the individuals and the roles that they play and how important they are. So please remember that, like uh, Boston, you can have just maybe three ties and still be extremely important in one measure, eigenvector centrality. And same with San Diego, it's nothing like, you know, um, going over to Newark, but these people are all cut off. So it has a very high score too for network analysis for betweenness. We're ready, aren't we? <laughs> All right. So I kind of explained, right, that it's about these hops and that it's everyone you know, which nobody has in their mind at all. But now I think you can see that, you know, Zuckerberg and Facebook, it, it's an interesting idea. Like, aren't you in touch with people from elementary school that you forgot? I mean, like, without that, you would... <laughs> really have completely forgotten me. Uh, so it is helping us a little bit to restore our memory of the six degrees. But what I want to do now is just give a few more demonstrations of this principle, and we'll use this example. These are the main actors from three movies. Animal House on the top right, Apollo 13 in the middle, A League of Their Own off on the left. And the, of course, star of the show here is Kevin Bacon. So I have put a red star next to him. And like I showed you for Socrates or Alexander the Great, he should be the most important person in his own network. We all are, face it, okay? But here, I wanna demonstrate a little bit about how networks work. Inside networks, generally speaking, are clusters or groups uh, if there's an, a sort of an affinity that they all share. Uh, there are different ways to sort of look at what's inside, but generally speaking, everyone is not evenly uh, tied to everyone else. That's just not real life. If that is what your social network graph begins to look like, you didn't do it right, okay? Generally speaking, people are kind of in their own thing, and what's really cool and interesting is to see how they might pass information across the borders. So just looking at this, you can see Kevin Bacon and Tom Hanks hold positions of power, would you say, in terms of their hierarchy and uh, what I'd like to do now is to just let you take a look for a moment at how many ties, that is the degree, how many ties people is Tom Hanks related to versus Kevin Bacon? If you want to count with me then, you've got Donald Sutherland, John Belushi, Kevin Bacon himself, but he's not tied to himself, so I'm not going to count him. So we'll use Bill Paxton for number three, and Gary Sinise, and Tom Hanks. Did you get that? One, two, three, four, five. I want to go now to Tom Hanks. Right? Oops. Oops. Okay. 
Mm-hmm. All right. And he is connected in one hop, right, to Kevin Bacon, Bill Paxton, Gary Sinise, Madonna, Rosie O'Donnell, and Penny Marshall, which means he has more than Kevin Bacon in terms of degree. Now, if John Belushi wants to get a message to Rosie O'Donnell, how many hops does it take and who does he have to cross through? (laughs) Bear with me. Belushi has no choice but to go to Bacon. This would be two hops. This is one hop. Okay, one. This is the most efficient one. Sure, he could go here and there or here and there and there and there, right? We can always get around it. There are redundancies in all networks, but to get there efficiently, he's going to go directly. So we've got Belushi to Bacon and then Hanks and then O'Donnell. So one, two, three hops. Now think about it in terms of um, taking flights. Are you going to pick the one that has, you know, Three hops, would you wish, wish it was just a oh, you know, direct flight? This is one hop, one degree, three degrees. So Belushi has three degrees of separation from O'Donnell. For between the centrality, these two are the most important. They are the gatekeepers. Do you see that? Do you agree with that? And the way we know this is if we eliminate them. <laughs> All right, so I just took out Tom Hanks. Do you see that? I just took him out, like terrorist. I took him out. And now it splits the network in two. It's disruptive and it isolates these three from the body of five. If Tom Hanks were a terrorist, um, is that the one we would choose to take out? Or perhaps you think Kevin Bacon is the one to take out to split up the group? So let's try that experiment. Okay, there. So when we take out Kevin Bacon, let me go back to that for a moment, take him out, we are left with this uh, duple, these two floating. And the rest of it basically stays together. So this is not efficient for us. This is not our established, you know, desired outcome. Which means then Tom Hanks has the highest between this centrality. He had the highest degree, he had the highest between this centrality. And I'm gonna save Eigenvector for another slide. Let's take a look at some samples of real world contemporary sociograms. This, as you can see, is a friendship network of sixth graders and uh, perhaps you can see that, I guess there's squares and there's circles and squares are boys and circles are girls. Betweenness, who has the highest betweenness centrality, friends? Basically these three, particularly this one, if you take her out, then this whole sort of Uh, component, we call them, floats away. It floats away like a balloon. It breaks it up. Passing legislation in the U.S. Senate, and this is the subject of many political scientists and sociology studies, that you can see um, here that there are just a few people who will cross over to vote with other senators of a different party, and that over time, this has um, diminished so that they are almost separate. Very interesting to see. So yes, uh, US senators, congressmen behave just like sixth grade children. (laughs) We use, of course, um, this kind of uh, graph to track diseases of various sorts, to see relationships of how things are spreading over time. Uh, On the left, you have in purple a map of Los Angeles. It's old now, but it's um, ostensibly a map of gang territory. 
And what the police and the FBI are looking at is how to break up this network of gangs who are uh, working together, essentially. And so if you use social network analysis tools, you would see that this one hazard had the potential of breaking this whole thing off into an island, right? And to switch gears a bit, you can use social network analysis um, to explore uh, organizations, that is companies. And uh, of course you have the traditional org chart at the top of how things get done, CEO at the top, some managers, some workers, but the green that you see is um, where uh, the work really gets done. These are the people that you want to kind of give uh, raises to that you want to hold on to because they are so important to the network as individuals and as a group. And finally, because I want to move on, I'll just show you the um, sort of granddaddy of them all, uh, which brought social network analysis to the fore in the intelligence community, which is the chart of the four airplanes in 9-11 with the hijackers that were associated with each other and assigned to these different um, planes. The colors represent the planes, and it turns out that the person with the highest betweenness and eigenvector centrality uh, is Mohammed Atta, which may be a familiar name if you followed that uh, 20 years ago. So in my own, I, um, I started really trying to understand these relationships inside classical Athens. And what we're looking at are the results of data that come from four lives of Plutarch, Plutarch's lives. Uh, he was a Roman writer, but Greek and wrote in Greek and lived in Greece. And he wrote these lives of famous people, including four contemporaries. They lived at the same time, Heracles, Nicias, Alcibiades, and Chimon. And so those are the four hubs you see here, but I'm interested in what ties them in between, what's interesting in between them. So clusters, are really integral to sort of making my case and understanding how first ideas flow and um, are they open to new ideas and open to outsiders or are they kind of closed and there's only one gatekeeper and they tend to keep the door locked, which means that ideas don't flow very readily. Um, and, and the other is just, again, uh, the idea of a complex adaptive system, which depends in part on these uh, networks working in tandem side by side uh, that are growing and learning and self-organizing and greater than the sum of their parts. So first, I just uh, briefly want to tell you about these weird customs of the Greeks that I think contribute to this because they spent um, so much of their lives in the company of other people and they went to these parties and these dr were drinking parties, basically. They had light hors d'oeuvres um, drinking parties. They were held at almost every night in different men's houses in all 1,000 Greek cities. And you would go, maybe eight to 16 men would be in one party. And then the next night, it would mix and match. You might go and find one of the guys you were with last night, also in this new one, but you meet all these other people. And so they're always sort of scrambling like those gray lines and seeing each other. And these were intense, really intense places where you um, were walk looking by lamplight. Things were a little different. It's um, sort of a synesthesia experience. There was incense. You see a bronze incense burner. There was you know, the bitter and the sweet on your tongue. There was music and poetry and people reciting things. It was, they were intense experiences and maybe you've had this where you've been to a dinner party and it was just extraordinary. The quality of the conversation, the you know deliciousness of the food, uh, you won't forget it. It's like an unforgettable night. They had this like all the time <laughs> and therefore the people are unforgettable too. They're enriching it, you know? There's another aspect, which is they called phylloxenia, but it's um, hospitality. 
And so having people in your home was so common. Uh, you welcomed pe people in, but also strangers. So if someone knocked on the door and they looked like they needed a bath and you know they'd really been struggling, you would invite them in. And you might even offer them a meal and some wine and have you know the maid undress him and give him a bath and maybe even offer to spend the night. This is um, the story of Odysseus at one point who comes to a palace and knocks on the door and they never ask until morning, who the hell are you? <laughs> Just like, because they could be a god in disguise. Then there were the gymnasiums. And this is where boys of a certain class, medium to upper, would get their education, but really get to know each other and be together. This is an example of a gymnasium, not a local one like we're seeing, but this is the one at Olympia. But what you would find, and here you can see in particular on the upper right, is that you'd, you'd have actually uh, classrooms for uh, reading and writing and learning literature and talking about Homer. Uh, you would have music lessons and you would exercise and those were equal three-parted education, their paideia. And uh, men, older people, would come and watch and the boys were mainly nude uh, exercising. That's just their custom. They did all gymnasium gymnastics and exercise, all the, uh, even running um, in the nude. And so gymnasium, gymnos means nude. Uh, and uh, they would hang out and um, get to know each other. So uh, this is the peninsula of Attica. It is the city state, state part of the city of Athens, which is this little peanut. And that's Piraeus, it's harbor, some five or so miles away. So this is the urban core with a walled city around it. But this, these are the Athenians. These are the Athenians. And even people who tended to live in the city, the wealthier ones, had a house out either on the shore or in the plains or up in the hills. And this is where the agriculture was getting done, too. Diane, we're, we're sometimes losing your cursor here. Oh, sorry. Okay, I know I'm doing it on the right instead of the left. Uh -huh. okay. okay, I got it. You can see it now, right? Go back to that last slide just real quickly. Yeah, yeah, we will do. Thanks. So this is the little peanut. This is Piraeus. But this is Attica. All right? And the new airport is down in here. If you've been in, then it gives you your bearings. All right? So this is an enormous area. Um, and that is where the citizens lived. Uh, so let me go through this, this chart I made just to kind of understand all the places where Athenians, now we'll focus in a bit, Athenians could be with other Athenians and meet each other and build their social networks. How did they do it? So we're going to start, uh, let me say, these are kind of places, spaces, place-based ties, but these are more human sort of human rights uh, rituals. I mean, not rights, rituals um, that are also uh, ways that they would get to know each other. So we start with the geographical. I showed you the countryside, the coast people live there. They've lived in tiny villages, about 100 plus of them throughout Attica. And all of them are Athenians. All of them have citizenship that are male, you know, free. Um, and so they would know each other from their locations and from the sacred spaces where they might go, where they would gather, and other public use areas, like here. Then you have uh, these artificial ways that the Athenian body as a whole is divided up. So these villages I spoke of, they are called deans, about a hundred of them, the little villages scattered throughout Attica. Uh, there were religious cults, and of course you could worship Hera here in one dean and also in another and also in another, and they might get together and know each other in that way and all the other different gods and goddesses. Uh, people are related by kinship, uh, kinship lines, 
And those are very big extended families, too, that may or may not actually be kin. Uh, then the tribes, uh, at a certain point, 508 BC, they just decided to divide all Athenians into 10 tribes. It doesn't mean relationship at all. It was a way of calling people up for military service or voting or some other mechanism. Fratries are what it sounds like, fraternities. They're sort of brotherly groups. Uh, so these are some ways then that the uh, Athenians could know each other. Then you move over sort of to business world, right? All of these that you can see have uh, clusters within them, craftsmen, for example. Within craftsmen, you've got woodworkers or um, people who work with ceramics, uh, marble workers, goldsmiths, iron workers. Those are sort of sub clusters of people who know each other pretty well. But if you're in one of those chains, like you have to provide the gold in order for that temple to be finished, then you're going to know those guys too. A lot of ways to know each other and different ways and mix and match. And then finally, in their government. So every job, like deputy mayor, every job had a board of 10. Yes, committee work. Every job had 10, one from each tribe, often selected by lottery. Seriously, by lottery. And then there were courts and you could volunteer to be on a jury and the juries were from 50 people all the way up to a thousand people, sometimes even more. You could serve for a year on the Council of 500. You could serve in the military, obviously. Um, religious ceremonies of the different cults, you could uh, worship together. And then you could attend the theater, which had between 5,000 and later with an addition, maybe 17,000 people in one setting for theaters. And you could actually be actors too. These are all social activities that made the Athenian people particularly tight knit so this is uh, an example of such interconnectivity. How do ideas flow? So let's take a look uh, just briefly at technology because you have to have buy-in for some of these technological ideas to grow. Um, the first example is of an individual who came up with a solution to a problem that then got adopted by the cities, and I mean all cities. So the problem is, how do you tell time when it's dark or when it's raining if you're using a sundial? Well, <laughs> the answer uh, that developed in the third century um, that was um, employed is quite complicated as an example of technology. Um, the very basic part of it is that a water, um, water comes down and raises this plunger thing uh, with a pointer. It raises it up, and this is on a turntable that's hydraulic. And as it turns, it gives you basically the time, and it's calibrated for summer and winter. And it's quite remarkable, and it was still in use mainly as the public way of telling time up until, um, you know, geared clocks. Uh, in this, so in the 17th century AD, and we have remains, you know, that's all that's left, uh, but we hear about them and they're written about. Um, another example, I mentioned the group lottery, um, that people were selected by lottery to be on a 10 person panel, let's say, to be mayor for the year. So you come in uh, with your ticket and you put it in one of the columns, and there are five columns, so 10. Uh, 10 uh, tribes essentially and then at the appointed time um, black and white balls are poured into this funnel so let's say we only need one group of 10 all the balls would be white except for one black one at the appointed time you open that little lever and the ball comes out and it's white and so you dismiss this top row and thanks for trying come back next year 
Next ball is white. The second row is dismissed. Mm -mm, no luck. The third one, let's say, is black. And that means that all three of these are going to get selected for the year uh, to be the mayors. That's how it worked for almost everything. The only uh, offices that were for that were voted upon were um, for uh, treasurer, because you had to be able to count at a pretty high level, and for uh, the generals, because uh, you needed some experience and they didn't necessarily want to rotate them out after 12 months. Voting, another example in former times, you would have pebbles and you would put them on either side, yes or no, of a, a base, uh, but people could see how you voted, and so it could be corruptible. And so the blind ballot was developed, and these were excavated in the Athenian marketplace, in the Agora. And to describe them, basically you get a pair. One has a hollow tube, like a straw, and the other is solid, like a chopstick. You get one for each hand, and you hold them in your hands like this, pinching the edges, and one, the hollow one, would be for if you think the person's guilty, and the, um, let's say, I, this is for a jury case, obviously, uh, and the solid one would be if he's innocent. And so no one can see how you voted. How were these ideas spread? That one is just so weird, right? That's not the way we would do it. We actually put a little curtain around ourselves to go vote privately. But someone or some group of people came up with this. And we think that uh, indeed it is through discussions in all these different ways, particularly maybe at symposia. So there might be a three week period before the monthly meeting where all um, citizen men, maybe about 10,000 showed up. There were about 25,000 citizens. 10,000 show up on this plateau called the Penix. And uh, so there might be three weeks notice and they're talking about it at these meetings and going, well, how else would you do a blind ballot? You know, it's a problem. I didn't want to show what, who I was voting for, you know. So it has to be through the social networks and these diagrams. So let's just take a little moment to play a guessing game. Uh, that night, eight of you were at a symposium and developed the idea of this sort of blind ballot notion, these tops, safeisma. And tomorrow night, you go out to different symposia each of us not overlapping, going to separate ones. So at the end of the second night, how many people would know about it? Someone type it in. Yay, thanks Tom, 64. Everybody has to get in on this game. <laughs> All right, so now we're going to go to the third night, and each of those 64 people are going to go to separate eight-person parties, talking about this, the pros and cons, improving it perhaps. Now how many people have talked about it? Ask Alexa. <laughs> 512, if no overlap. Exactly right, no overlap. <laughs> the fourth night, 512 people go to different symposia and explain the idea. Now, how many at the end of the night will know? Yeah, 4,096 people will have discussed it. 4,096 people are going to completely different dinner parties with eight people each at them. Now what? Yeah, 32,768. I said there are about 25,000 uh, citizens, so who knows? <laughs> All right. So this, these are the superstars of Socrates' social network. These are the people most classicists, at least, have heard of, have heard of. There's a lot more who are not. 
Uh, Socrates, of course, was a great philosopher. He lived 70 years, the whole basically 5th century BC. And um, he, he was famous because he never stayed home. He never slept in. He'd get on his sandals and go to the market area, go wherever he could find people. And he was the most social person that we've ever heard of. And this is what one of his biographers says. Moreover, Socrates lived ever in the open, for early in the morning he went to the public promenades and training grounds. In the forenoon he was seen in the market. And the rest of the day he passed just where most people were to be met. He was generally talking and anyone might listen. And so I want to show you basically how I built the social network of Socrates. And it starts as this demo. It's all of Plato, right? I'm just giving you a little, little bit of something called Xenophon's Symposium. He was also a student of Socrates. And he talks about Callias, the richest man in Athens, who had a boyfriend named Autolycus. And this is part of that gymnasium scene I was trying to describe. Autolycus has a father um, who is called Nicaratus, and the three of them are walking through town. And they bump into, on the sidewalk, Socrates, Critobulus, Hermogenes, Antisthenes, and Carmides. And Callias calls them over and basically invites them to a symposium. I'm a, this is fantastic. I'm about to give a dinner in, in honor of Autolycus and his father, and gosh, it would be so great if you guys would come in number seven down below, skipping a little bit. Now, at first, Socrates and his companions thanked him for the invitation, but would not promise to attend the banquet. When it became clear, however, that he was taking their refusal very much to heart, they went with him, and so his guests arrived some having first taken their exercise and their rub down, others with the addition of a bath. So that is an introduction to Greek culture. But this is what's important about it. I have two columns of these relationships. The first line was Hipponicus and the father of Callias III. Then Callias and the father of the boy, Lycon, Lycon or Autolycus, Callias, etc. All the people that they meet need to be um, tied together we call this an edge list. The edge is the link between the two ties in graph theory. We end up with 36 vertices or 36 nodes with 53 ties between them, unique edges, which is quite unusual. And um, the average distance is 3.1. And I'm finding in almost all of the cases that three degrees of separation is the average for hmm, a good social network. Uh, so this is what it looks like when I finished with it. And you see Socrates and the colors are clusters within it. So on a bigger scale, we have uh, their Pericles in red inside the network of Socrates, a detail. And this is Socrates's network and the clusters within it. So uh, we're looking really at um, a subset with 186 nodes, and everywhere you're seeing sort of red pop, those are um, clusters or relationships that were identified through algorithms, and that's so Socrates, of course. Here, what we're looking at, again, from the first slide, I think, um, are the relationships of Socrates between the Socratics, which is the dark green circle at the bottom, the um, sophists or tutors that are the light green circle, beneath them uh, sort of the red ones are foreign philosophers who came to study and be near Socrates, the yellow ones are their students, and the blue are intellectuals like Pericles, like the playwrights and others, and the big blue wheel are all of are, are none of the above and um, other Athenians that we know Socrates talked with. Okay. I mentioned some centrality measures. Um, the betweenness made some sense. I think, I hope, the eigenvector centrality being people who know people with high scores. 
and we did talk about this before. So I'm just going to um, look here now at the people who have the highest eigenvector centrality scores to Socrates. And this is um, a lot of, uh, I don't know, jargon uh, for saying, even in Roman times, the big question was, who were the most intimate with Socrates? Who were in his inner circle? People have wanted to know this. In the Renaissance, this was a guessing game people played. And you can read all of Plato and still not quite be satisfied that you have a list of men who you think hung out with him the most. So I said to myself, what if we could just ask who have the highest eigenvector centrality scores, given that Socrates has the highest scores, these would be the people who are closest to the people who have highest scores, and it looks like this. They are all tied together, except for the outlier. So this is Socrates, the next highest, they're tied, these two, Tessippus and Simeus, the next ones down in this hierarchy, there are 13 of them all together. And why is Alcibiades an outlier? We learn from, of Socrates' passion for the young Alcibiades in the opening line of the Protagoras, where Socrates is greeted with these words, quote, friend, where have you been now, Socrates? Ah, but of course you have been in chase of Alcibiades and his youthful beauty. Well, only the other day as I looked at him, I thought him still handsome as a man, for a man he is, Socrates, between you and me, and with quite a growth of beard. So they were lovers. Alcibiades was a ward of Pericles. He lost his father early. He lived with Pericles. He became a notorious um, political persona in Thucydides' history of the Peloponnesian War. Well worth getting to know, and Plutarch has a life of him as well. Okay, we're running short on time at this point, but I did want to say so far, you've been looking at the elite. All right, and um, that's who, whose work has have survived is talking about the elite, but I've been able to find information about subaltern networks, that is lower class networks. Uh, we know of them, of course, from Day's paintings, the women at the Fountain House, a particularly gendered space. And I was able to identify women inside these networks. So here you have Pericles' network and the light blue are women and we've kind of known uh, in history that women tie families together that's you know with the dowries and you know uh, political marriages and so on but here you can actually see it which is exciting and then i did the same inside socrates's social network which i think is really interesting if i had more time we could go into um, what these patterns kind of mean so uh, there are ways to dig deeper underneath the surface level. Yeah, I've had a lot of questions so far, so if you wanted to spend another five minutes on that, I, see, I, I, I won't worry about it. Excellent. Okay, yes. Um, so let me just show you that women were educated too. On the right, surely you can see that she's reading a scroll, a scroll that she's taken out of a chest that's on the floor with a lid, so she's got a book collection is what she's got. And then on the left, um, again, another box uh, being held, but we have a music lesson going on with a kithara and a lyre, these two stringed instruments, beautiful stringed instruments that uh, women played, as did men. Another group, very briefly to show you, is the work I'm doing right now this summer with a National Endowment for the Humanities grant, which are the um, red figure vase painters. We finished the black figure in 2019, my partner Eleni Hasaki at the University of Arizona and I. And um, we believe that we can understand the diffusion of technical innovation 
going from black figure, as you see here, with red background, to red figure with the black background. We know it happened in a period from about 525 to 480, maybe even closer to the 480 period. And yet, um, it's very hard to see how the diffusion worked, how it caught on. And these are craftsmen, these are workers, but to some degree, they are named. So this was our work that we finished on the black figure vases. I know it's hard to see because it was so hard to put on one chart, uh, the 701 nodes uh, or artists. But what we could do is trace these flows inside of it. And the ones that you can see named here are very important vase painters from a stylistic point of view. So what we're working on this summer is doing that with the um, red figure as well. So these are just some of the clusters we identified. And then these chains of innovation, these tech transfer is what we're calling it really. In the black figure, you can see seven degrees to get from this, uh, this part down to that part, um, which is kind of exciting to see. You can't get that from reading these reports on Greek vases coming up on um, in excavations. So uh, for betweenness, betweenness is the way, right? This is the way that innovations are going to be transferred. So the top, um, the, the top between the centrality ones are what we were looking for. And this is, I think, our red figure one, which we have not yet analyzed. We've, we're still generating, we collected the data and we're now generating the charts. One of our proofs of concept, um, which we did in 2017, was to take um, a list of potters and painters that someone had put together and transcribe it into social network sociogram form. And what we found were 39 artists uh, located in this area. And the red are painters and the blue are potters. So we have potters and painters collaborating in a very long chain of interconnected uh, artists, which was kind of exciting to see. Uh, they are red figure and we only were looking in black, but now we're doing the red and this I generated this week. Those are those same artists now lit up in the context of red figure. So we're really, really excited about this. That's kind of a, a close up to see not just uh, the phenomenon of those 39, but who they are connected to and who they are connected to. And this is the same thing, but without the mess of the labels. When we get to networks of this size and scale, getting rid of those labels helps tremendously because now you can see those hubs. There's Newark, there's San Diego, <laughs> right? Uh, and uh, it's kind of exciting, yeah. And that's the final one, I think. This um, GIF shows the flow of the artists that were active over time. So where it started were the oldest ones, the earliest ones in about a century of work. They weren't all contemporary, in other words. But starting there and moving up, we're at 550 to 500, 525, 475, 450 BC, 425 BC, and 400 going around. So this work is still sort of in, uh, um, in progress. And I will not do who built the Parthenon. <laughs> I'm going to stop on this one. And uh, now would be a great time, I think, to try to bring all of this together and make it um, relevant for you. So I really welcome uh, your questions. And thank you, uh, Peter Schmidt, for hosting me tonight. Um, Deborah, thank you. They are themselves art. Um, I have to <laughs> take each one of those little dots and like stretch them. I tried to make the point earlier that the distance has no meaning, that it's more important to cluster together ones that are like, maybe of the same date, uh, so that you can make more sense of the whole. And so I work long and hard <laughs> on these. But, and I feel like an artist would, where I'm really learning and seeing as I go. And uh, it's, you have to be patient, but
but it's enormously rewarding. Thank you.